Mom hates him and you're under him. <laughs> your mom's not about you. More, more. Your mom still likes me. What up, guys? Um, today I am going live, 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 live with Jake Bennett, and I am so excited because not only is Jake Bennett just a fucking legend, he is one of my great friends, and I'm so excited to have him on today. Um, all right, he's requested to come on, so I'm really excited. Let's do it. Yes! I think this is my claim to fame, this song, for sure. Hello! Hello! How are you? I'm great now because I just got to watch you sing along to my song for at least 20 seconds, which has been a dream it of was... mine for a while, Needs, so... Oh my gosh, it was it was an amazing time, and you know I love this song, and you know I promote it wherever I go, even well, though Well, the I... song is really made by you shouting yes at least once. So, I mean, I think so. I'm yeah. really glad you gave me a credit on that on Instagram. I really thank you for that. I think I gave you 45% songwriting credit as well, but maybe you haven't right. got the check yet. Well, I'm, I'm going to be waiting on my 50,000. So when that comes right. in, I'll let it you know. It should come soon. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's on its way. <laughs> How are you, though? I'm pretty excited because you have something else coming out today. I do. In fact, it just came out for me because I'm on, a, like you, yeah, I'm on a different time zone. So I just got the... right notification that jake bennett released a new song which is surreal because i am jake bennett that's and that's insane we Your just box. blasted it up on a trail in los angeles with a glass of champagne so it's real oh now. that is beautiful a sunset yeah. and a new song i don't feel like there's like any other feeling than that and i'm so excited i would um, agree i want to talk I about <laughs> i want to talk about the song a little later but I know there's some people on here that like we have different followers and stuff and I obviously know you pretty well, but I wanted, um, you know, the viewers to get to know you a little bit more before you hear, before they hear about your song. Are you going to grill me, Nina? A little bit, a okay. little bit. Okay, I'm ready. No, it's, it's not a grilling, even though it's grilling season, but we're not making burgers. We're not making patties. If anything, we're making very gourmet hot dogs. Uh, it feels like so a gourmet saying. hot dog to me. Already, I'm getting big <laughs> gourmet hot dog vibes. Good, 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 good. Okay, well, here, let's start with the hot dog, okay? So we've got the bun. And essentially, my first question to you, and this is the bun, is what was your first song? I've got to know. Like, what was the first song you wrote and what was it about? Well, the, the first song I... There's two answers to that. The first song I wrote, I was seven, and it was called Without You, and the chorus was... Without you, I'm just a fish out of water trying to find the sea. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about my best friend. Um, oh! So that was my first song, and it, it was as bad as it sounds. And then my first actual song that I released, or at least to my memory, was a song called Smells Like Summer, um, which was with my previous band called Early Hours in South Africa. Yeah. And we put it out, I guess, like a week before I finished my final high school exams. And wow. it like, charted on number one on SoundCloud. And it was this very weird thing where I was writing like a final maths exam and failing it. I got 46%. And, oh, um, no. and suddenly felt like my life might be taking another direction. And that's really why I started doing music. That was never the plan. I was going to go into journalism. Okay. Or something. But then I had a song that was doing really well online. So I flew to New York. And the rest was at least my. Wow. Life. Yeah. Yeah, so you weird. so you had a song, where was it doing? It was doing well in England or South Africa? Well, it was actually, I was in South Africa, but South Africa didn't have Spotify or um, Apple Music or anything at the time. So it was actually taking off like around, like a, on, in America, Canada, Singapore and London were the four like big. Um, it was the first wow. song in South African history to get a million plays. It was like this fucking, it was bizarre. And yet, like in South Africa what? at the and time, at least, no one really knew about it because they had no access because it was a third world country. Wow. Um, so yeah. then I ended up going to New York and that's why I actually studied at Berkeley because I needed to get a visa to try and get to America because that's where all of my fans were. Um, wow. So you, yeah. you, I mean, that's a big dedication and a big leap of faith to, you know, come to somewhere where you have these fans that you, you really didn't know. Like, how did sure. you feel like moving and then, you know, kind of reconnecting physically with your fans here? Well, it wasn't a leap of faith for me. For me, I was just 18 and really excited about everything. I think it was a leap of faith. That's awesome. Parents. Yeah, I was just okay. I was yeah. running with the tide. I, I'm grateful to them for letting that happen. In hindsight, yeah. in hindsight, 
uh, it was it was a pretty insane decision. Like I didn't think anything through. I literally right, finished so, writing yeah. exams and got on the plane. So yeah, I was that was going to be my next question. Like, did you did you think about it at all, or were you like, I'm going to go to this school called Berkeley, and I'm going to get a visa, and I'm going to just figure it out and take it from there? Like, was it comforting to know that you had music, or were you just a little bit scared by that? Um, I suppose I suppose at the time I probably thought about it more than I think I did now looking back. At the time right. I had a song that sat at the number one spot on SoundCloud and I had people messaging me that I didn't have faces for. So it right. seemed like a logical thing. It was like, oh, I'm, I'm famous now. I was not, obviously. <laughs> but in, in my head, right. in my 18 year old brain, I was like, this is the only option. Um, yeah, of course. And it wasn't scary. It was just exciting because you're 18 years old and you I'd never, I think I'd been to America once on holiday and it, it was, there was no fear. There's never, there was, there's never going to be fear in something like that. It's just pure, pure elated joy. I, I love that you say there was like no fear because I feel like a lot of people move to the United States and it's big and it's scary and you have a lot of expectations, but you kind of went into this, like some, like whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Like, Right. If you were to have, if this song wouldn't have worked out for you, do you, did you have a backup plan or were you like, no, I'm just going to figure I, it out? I had no backup plan. Did, what, what, That's did, what, awesome. How did you feel? Do you remember being scared when you moved out here? Because you, I mean, you have family here. Yeah. But... Uh, I didn't have family in the US, but I, like, I did the same thing. I was like, I got it into this school called Berkeley and I was just like, uh, I guess I'm going. Um, and yeah, I was definitely scared. I came from a super small country town. And I'd never been to the United States other than when I was born. And I think, like, I didn't have any connections or I didn't have a song or anything um, that was out. I just had a, a citizenship and a school entry. And I was like, I guess I'm moving into the dorms and I'm doing it. And, I, I, and I'll see what happens. Yeah. But I, I think, think, like... Do you, do you look back on that and wish that you could still find that unbridled, like, joy and because now I know that you would overthink everything right I feel like you would never just move countries now without thinking about it I don't think I would I feel like honestly I was I'm the opposite now I think when I was not when I was 18 19 I took my six months to be like okay I've got to make this much money and I worked like so many hours and to save up to come to America and now I'm like if someone asks me to go to Japan and write a song I'm going like, well, you know, Japan it's, is it's switched. Because they have sushi and stuff. So that's a terrible. Well, yeah. I do, and, see what you're saying. <laughs> I do see what you're saying. Yeah. Maybe. Well, that's a cool outlook. You've just got more. Yeah. You're, you're just even more of a free spirit. So that's. that's yeah. Like, it's interesting. But do you, in terms of artistry, like I know you were with early hours. Were you still with early hours when you had moved to Boston? Yeah. So that was the song that it was an early hour song that had, had um, gone viral, so to speak. And uh, right. for, for two years in Boston, I made that, we pretty much made that work. Then at that point, like Spotify came to South Africa. So then we started, and we started getting radio play there. So I had this fan base in America that I had absolutely no way of contacting because they're just names on a, they're not even names on a screen, they're numbers on a screen. And then I had, right. yeah. I suppose, faces of sorts in South Africa. So I was basically in, in class four days a week. And then every second week I was on a plane to fucking Canada or back to South Africa to play a show um, or wherever it was. And I, I suppose I stayed afloat, but for the first two years, it was just, it, or I was on like a Skype call because it was on with our management because it was on a different yeah. time zone. So I was very much like just in early hours and tr d had no idea why I was even at this school because I wasn't focused on that. I was trying to be in a band. Um, yeah. yeah. And then when we disbanded that, I got to focus on Berkeley and that's so how I ended up kind of, being doing the solo thing and songwriting because I suddenly found I had a love for songwriting rather than originally I just stumbled in and I sort of came yeah. out of it with a total infatuation and passion and love for it. That's so interesting that you say that you were going to do journalism if you hadn't done music because I find like a lot of your songs they're stories and you are such a story person like when we have conversations it's not just hi how's your day like there's a story behind everything and I'm curious as to like do you think about that when you songwrite? Like, I know you're very charismatic and comedic as well. Like, does that play into your songwriting, the storytelling, the comedy? Like, what, what goes through your head when you're writing a song? Um, it does. That's a very lovely question. I have, I, was, the, I have two obsessions. The one obsession is I have this idea that as long as we've been humans, we've pretty much had four things. 
And those were sex, war, stories, and maybe buying a drink from someone. I figure that like in Norway, when it was freezing cold, they were telling stories to keep warm or in Africa when they couldn't, you know, they had nothing, but they were writing pictures on a wall that was storytelling. I also think they were right. probably having sex, yeah. fighting, and maybe um, <laughs> getting drunk off some that, or getting somewhere high in between. Like so, so yeah, my obsession probably. with storytelling is that it's like a primal art form, and I try. That's why I love it so much because it feels like it just feels like something that like is the one thing that we have to keep going, and that someone has to someone has to root for and that's you feel like you it. have to carry yeah okay no I don't so feel you like feel I like you have the burden of storytelling on my shoulders but i do feel like <laughs> i love it very much and i want to try and that that's everything i do no it's definitely weighing you down yeah like, it's pretty much it yeah, out. You know what? You, yeah, it's me and jk rowling <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> <laughs> you've just got the biceps so you know <laughs> <laughs> but then i'm allowed to say that i'm your friend <laughs> <laughs> the other side of that is comedy which is my new obsession um, and I just have this, I've been studying it so hard for like a year, Nina, because I have this feeling that comedy and, and songwriting are like the exact same thing. Like all you Interesting. have, I mean, comedy, so in comedy, the only thing is you don't have a band, so you have to be way better at it. And I think that if you would, re we can oh. dive into, we don't have to, but if you really dissect it, like, no, please go for it. The setup for the joke would be like the verse, like the punchline could be the chorus. Like you've got like little added like hooks or instrumentals in there, like before you get to the punchline to try and keep your audience engaged. So that's like, right. so I just, I think that there's like weird parallels with that. So I try and now incorporate that into songwriting. And I, I like the idea of like having something that on the, on the surface is just a joke. But if you look harder, it could be a commentary on it, like a deeper issue or a more like. A well, yeah. And I, I mean, I feel like even with like your song, I hope your mom hates him. Like that title in itself is just so, Right, funny and exactly, charismatic but then you look at the lyrics and you're just like oh actually yeah no i, I really hope this this girl mum <laughs> yeah, hates him you know like fuck yeah. this guy but <laughs> right but do you yeah. draw where do you draw your inspiration from because i feel like i know you and I, I you know still listen to songs and i go i wonder where he came up with that and i feel like sometimes when we talk like you're writing down notes and i know that's on your stories that's become a quite a big thing your thoughts so do these notes play into your songs or like, where do you draw your inspiration from? Um, yeah, a lot of it is, is just from getting really hammered and then finding a note the next morning after talking to my friend Nina and she had, some, actually, I had a good one from two days ago, which I'll show you, I'll show you after that. Um, oh boy, uh, I'm I, nervous. I think my biggest inspirations are like, I, I love the idea of, of, at the moment at least, of just moments and the idea of things that like come to an end. So I've been trying to draw mm -hmm. inspiration from stuff that to me is connotates joy but then is has an ending so like helium balloons because like you see a helium balloon it's fucking happy but you know it's gonna float off into the sky or ice creams because it melts or hangovers because you had a great yeah. night and now you have nothing or sunsets because it's gonna start again so right now like i just get really inspired and excited every time i like come up with something that just reminds me of like happiness but the fact that that's fleeting and that's i don't i don't know how i could clarify that as inspiration but for some reason it is it makes me want to write stuff every no story. definitely do you feel like you draw most of your inspiration from your own personal experiences or do you sometimes because i know you listen a lot like i love talking to you because you genuinely listen and have you ever written songs about something that someone else has gone through and said or is it mostly like personal experiences um i think they tend to be it's lovely that you pick up on that they tend to be from other people or at least tidbits of conversations that i hear or pe things that people tell me but then Interesting. it's really hard to be genuinely empathetic unless you kind of flip it onto your own life. So I try and take yeah. inspiration from other people or stuff like here and then try and apply it to like my own experience. That tends to be the... That okay, the that's cool. And then as an artist, like you've like just hearing the songs you're coming up with and what's coming and you know what you've created so far how has your artistry changed from early hours to then moving to boston to kind of, you know going into your solo career like how has your songwriting changed and how has your artistry changed and i know you've said you're still figuring that out i mean shit we're 23 24 like we're getting there but how how have you found to be able to streamline your sound is it through listening to different bands is it to playing different chords on the guitar like how has that happened? I think it has to be from like the people around me, right? Like, I don't know if I've changed that much, but I've got to work with geniuses like yourself out here who are 
just better. I think that's when we can get better. So whether it's producers or songwriters or someone shouting yes really perfectly at the right moment of the song, I think that's <laughs> how, so sweet. I think that's pretty all the bassist that is downstairs currently that plays in all of my songs. Great I think that's bassist. How, that's how I've progressed. It's from working with people who are objectively a lot better than I am. Okay. And I've yeah. got to ask, I've got to ask about your shirt. Uh, what's the story I, with the open shirt? What's I just the did story? Button, you, I it's did your look now. Right before this. And you know Why? Because I, I had sunglasses <laughs> and they were like up to here. And I was like, no, I can tell that that's too much because the sunglasses are drawing attention to it. So I did have an extra ah, I like it. You yeah. really thought of it. Wait, we can't be color coordinated without even thinking. Right. And I've got a cap that matches. I like it. I like it. Huge. We've got to do this more often. <laughs> yeah, we should. It's weird that you haven't asked me in all of all of this time, but it's okay. I, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, we should honestly do a photo shoot. Maybe start an Instagram page. I, we I should talk about it later. I was talking talk to Chris about, about, about your live streams and how many I reckon I caught. I think I've seen eight. And I re how many have you done? Have you been counting? I haven't, but probably around that. Yeah. You must be over. No, you must be over like thirty, right? Oh, right you mean now, like right? you mean like playing playing live streams or into yeah like live streams. over this isolation period i think i've seen you do eight six six to nine live streams let's say i've seen eight yeah i've done i've done a lot <laughs> done a lot you should be keeping track of this i feel like it's you should have a spreadsheet i i mean i yeah i should probably have a spreadsheet i honestly am surprised i don't because i love spreadsheets because i'm a nerd like that are you but, a spreadsheet um, slut? I am a spreadsheet slut. Do you I have, love what's that you just like darkest slut. spreadsheet? Do you have any where you're like, I don't know why I'm doing this? So, you know, I used to work for Red Bull uh, yeah. back in Boston. Um, and when I was managing there, I was coordinating an event. Um, actually, I have two. I have two. I'm so glad you asked <laughs> because I'm so excited to talk about them. Um, so I was coordinating the whole team thing for Red Bull Crash Dice, which involved like 30 students or whatever and I had a spreadsheet which had I think 20 different tabs all color coordinated with lots of different names with algorithms with categories with different fonts there was underlining there was bolding God, you're in my feet. That's crazy. God I went deep and then I when I did my tour we had a whole budget spreadsheet which is normal but of course mine had tons of different colors because why would you just have a black and white spreadsheet? Is it one of those things where other people see your spreadsheet and they're like, oh God, she's really trying to overachieve here. But maybe actually, it's an over, you. maybe they're like, they're, she's overachieving or they're like, God, I should really take like a masterclass from her. Not just, you know, in wearing hoops, but right. spreadsheets. They're jealous, of your, they're jealous of your spreadsheet. Yeah, I get it. I think so. I yeah. think so. Are I'll you a spreadsheet later. slut or no? I feel you're more of a diary person. I'm not, no, well, maybe I suppose it depends how you look at it, but my, I know what a spreadsheet slut is. I'm familiar with the concept because my dad <laughs> is like, like he can track, he can track how many units of alcohol he's had every week since like 19 wow. years or like how, how many miles he's run every day since like the eight, Stop like it. It all written down. So if he like, if he ran and how fast he ran it. So if, the other day he, he called me today, he was like, Jake, I ran 17 kilometers and I did it in like five minutes. And he was like, that's of my course. class since 2004. I was like, it's so weird that you know that. <laughs> it's just... That's insane. Yeah, it's Do crazy. you record anything like that? Do you, because Lev, our good friend Lev here just called you a diary bitch, which I feel like could be accurate. <laughs> uh, do, you, uh, do you record anything like this? Like, I mean, do you record how many bottles of bourbon you've been drinking or? No, that, that, would be, <laughs> that would be a bad idea. That would lead me to question a lot of things. Um, I do, I do, I don't diary, but I do like write, I like to write short stories and I change my name to Cameron when I do, and I write it about like someone else, but it's actually about me so I can look back and I date that. And so if something good happens or bad happens, I have like a story about it, but I can distance myself. Oh, wow. That. That's cool. Not embarrassed. Yeah. Wait, you said, sorry, you cut out, you, you call him, you call the person, you address it to Cameron or you talk about it as if it was Cameron. I change my, I write it like third person and I make my name Cameron. So that, oh, like, cool. I why Cameron? I don't, I don't know why Cameron. I have no idea, but it's always been Cameron. You could and be then Cameron. I, well, maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just, I'm a, you know what? I'm a Cameron in a Jake's body. I've always <laughs> felt like a Cameron. Good. No, honestly, when I first saw you, I thought it was Cameron. And then you said Jake and I was a little right. disappointed, but I guess we're going to, we're going to deal with it. So. And finally I'm validated. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, speaking so, of quarantine yeah. and, 
and not so much spreadsheets, but, you know, being in quarantine, I think I asked you this the other day, you've got such a sunny disposition and you're just so happy and positive. And I feel like you're making these bangers, which I'm super excited about it. Um, but how do you remain to stay, you know, inspired and, and what's kind of your whole thing and not being able to perform live um, at this time? Like, how is that affecting you as an artist? Gosh, I don't know. I was thinking about the live thing because I, I as I told you, I haven't been on anyone's live stream this whole time because it gives I know, me crazy I'm, anxiety. I'm so excited. But, well, so, how do you feel now? Do you feel anxiety? I feel or you great, sure? but, it's, I, but only because it's you. But do you, <laughs> well, do you get the same rush doing this as you get from like a live show or because you can't see people? You know, how much of, this is what I was wondering, how much of a mm. live show is like about the person and seeing their reaction and how much you think it's just a super indulgent thing of, of the performer? I like doing these types of things where I'm speaking to another artist because I can right. see comments, right? So right. on Instagram, I feel like it's great. And while I'm speaking to another artist, the people who are watching and listening, they also get to enjoy the artists they may be listening to um, and ask questions, for example. So I love doing this type of stuff. Also, if I wasn't in music, would want to be a host. So for me, this is right. super fun. Right. Um, yeah. But it definitely pl does play a toll on me when... Uh, you know, we do, I do the live streams with Chris and Spoof every Tuesday and it is really hard to play to a phone essentially. Yeah. And although you're playing to people who are watching you, you have to imagine that applause. And that's really hard yeah. because I do feel like I put myself on stage. Yeah, of course, because I enjoy it and I, I live to be on stage, but you also live for a crowd's reaction. You live right. to see them singing your songs and enjoying your music. So uh yeah i don't know i find i find that i'm we're so lucky to have live streams but it is really taxing as a as an artist um yeah. especially if you love performing so that's why yeah, i was wondering I like rush. yeah yeah because you're a great live performer as well and i i was going to ask you about that like is that something that you've had to practice being on stage or it just comes naturally and yeah kind of about that um, yeah, well, thank you. I, yeah, I have, I think it's probably the thing I've worked hardest at, but what I worked at was trying to make it not seem like a performance. That's maybe right. like a defense mechanism for me. And also if I, I always liked acts when they feel like they're at the same level as an audience. I think it's a British thing. I don't know if you ever, this goes mm. out to comedy. I don't know if you've ever seen like a British stand up comedian or American stand up comedian. An American stand up is like better than the audience. And it's a really cool thing. Like Kevin Hart's a fucking yeah. rock star. Whereas like a British yeah. stand up is he's like the court jester, like he's 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 like Ricky Gervais and he's telling them how fat he is or whatever. And I think that's yeah. like a really interesting thing. And I've always tr I've worked really hard at trying to find that dynamic in my own performance of like I'm at the exact same level as you, but also you should watch me. And I yeah. don't think I've worked it out yet, but I've definitely put a lot of thought into it. That's, that's what's been what's played into your thought. Like, have you tried different things doing like when you performed live? Have you tried different things that like, what's one thing that you found worked really well? Not to give away all your secrets, just like one thing yeah, that the, you yeah, found was interesting. Yeah, element press of elimination. I've tried to do the thing where it's like, I, I had a song and the chorus was, I don't want your respect, I just want your attention, because I was trying to be a rock star. This was like early in Love the it. days of the band. And uh, it did not work. No one believed it. It was pathetic. Um, right, yeah. And so I found, <clears throat> I found along the line that I'm, I, I work better as a performer if I demand absolutely nothing <laughs> other than to try and be your friend. Right. So that, but well, for, do you think, sorry, so keep, keep going. Well, I was going to say for you, you are able to be a diva on stage, which I envy. I could never pull that off. Have you worked hard <laughs> at that or is that your natural stance as a performer? Um, I think performance for me came very naturally. Like songwriting is something that came later on in life i was terrified i was like ah uh, right. writing and putting my feelings on paper and singing that's terrifying. right but you were singing into um, a room at like age four right no question i've oh absolutely i've been singing into wooden sticks when we were camping around america since i was two so <laughs> for me getting on a table and singing there was no shame um but no definitely the diva stands and i think it's changed as well where i was trained to always be in heels, always have jewelry, always have rings, something right. to do with that um, and be that diva. Whereas I've kind of changed now in the sense of like, yes, I'm here. And if you come to my show, like I want you to pay attention to me, but I also want you to have this experience and leave anything behind that may be worrying you. And we're kind of in this space together rather than right. it's all about me. 
because yeah. that's not what I feel music is about. And music right, should be an all-inclusive thing. You where it's, a host, so it's never going to be about yeah, 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 and that you'd be able to, you know, just enjoy your time here rather than, I don't know, it's all about yeah. me. I don't, I don't like that. But it's interesting that you say that the comedy stands of American comedy and British comedy. I mean, I watch a lot of Australian comedy, which is just pretty self-deprecating. <laughs> we <laughs> just take the piss out say, of each yes, other. But, but yeah, yeah so I mean, maybe I, I feel I like I've got the Kevin Hart. I thought I wanted to be the American comic in a performance setting, but actually that didn't work. But I wish that I could. That's just, just to clarify that thought. But go on, sorry. No, so you were saying, say that again. Sorry, I, you cut out. What I meant by the comedy thing was that, like, I thought I wanted to be the American comic that was bigger than the audience, but I just right. worked hard, or Dave Chappelle, but I, I worked out that just didn't work for me, and I had to be, like, the British court gesture. Interesting. Was Do you feel like, since you've become DIY, maybe it's, like, a DIY artist, that it's maybe humbled you in that sense a little bit, that that's played into your performance? That's a great point. Yeah, I must have done. Yeah, I'd never thought of that until now. I'm probably going to stay awake all night thinking about it. But without question, <laughs> but there's like a, I think there's definitely a, 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 an aspect of that for sure. Yeah, because it must have been interesting going from a team to then kind of figuring it out on your own and trying, you know, trial and error along the way. Right. Um, is, there a, is there like a piece of advice that you could give to any artist, any songwriter, someone that's watching on here right now? Like, from going from a band to DIY, like what is one thing that you really took with you? Um, well, when I was playing in this band early hours, we still had this weird dichotomy of being quite successful in some places and not at all in others. The best example I could give of that was we played a show where we opened for the Lumineers in front of, I believe 20,000 people. And two days later we played in Toronto to I think the bartender, but he might've left as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just figured that I had to treat the gig the exact same. And I think we mm -hmm. played a week before in front of four people as well. So it was like, you're never gonna have any consistency in anything you do, I figure. And I know nothing, but I just think you have to treat it all as if you're playing to no one, but also as if you're playing to 20,000. Whether that's songwriting, that's you so want important. to be by a million, but you also want it to connect to literally one person lying on the floor of their bedroom. Um, so I, I try, love that you said that. I, do, I try and tailor it to both audiences. And I'm still that's working out, but that's amazing. Nicole. Yeah, but that's that's amazing advice. I think sometimes people definitely go into music and they're, they're like, we're not going to do any shows unless it's the big ones. And you're like, well, that's what the big ones. Like, what does that I, mean? Like, is that 20? Is that 20,000 right now? Like, you yeah. have to kind of measure it <laughs> where I, you are, you, you know? If you only do big ones, then you have no perspective anyway. So they all feel small. So yeah, it's, it's so nice much more personal. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, we cool. have a question from Lev. Do either of you worry about slash interpret your own artistic ambitions as narcissism? And do you think it inhibits your work? I'm going to let you go first because I feel like you have a great answer for this. I can't believe you're reading the comments. I didn't even realize this was happening. Wait, you go first, Nina. I'm going to read the comments. Okay, no. Well, I'll we go have... First, I'm gonna go you go, it's about you. You go first. <laughs> I don't know if it's narcissism. Do you think it inhibits your work? Yeah, I think so. You have. To, it has to be... Not narcissist. I think I just accept it to be narcissism and then hope that by the time it's been, um, it's from the conception, it's narcissism. And hopefully by the time it actually becomes a real thing, it, it's just, you're doing it for someone else. I think that there must be some kind of journey. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yes, I mean, that does make that sense. I it think, would be ridiculous think... not to call it narcissism though. I don't know if it's narcissism. I, I've struggled with this question because I, I sometimes think, am I being too humble or am I being too into myself? And at one point, are you too into yourself? Because being an artist or a songwriter, this is such a tough industry. So like, if you're not going to believe in yourself, like, and I, it may sound cliche, but if you're not going to believe in yourself, then who the bloody hell is, you know? Yeah. So, and that is, it's so tough because I've been through both experiences where someone, where you're just trying to do everything possible to reach your goals and your dreams. Yeah. And someone is like, you're too into yourself right now. And I'm like, am I, or am I just really working hard for myself? Cause yeah. I'm my own business in that sense. So when you, I don't know that it's, it's definitely a tricky question. And I think, but I, but if I think anything, that you're definitely doing it for other people at the same time, right? Even though you, even though you, oh, one hundred percent. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, like this. I don't think you should go into music being like, like, yeah, for example, this live stream thing, like I enjoy it for sure. Like I love doing this, but at the end of the day, it's not so I get more followers or whatever. It's so I can connect with different artists so that my followers can, you know, find a different artist that they didn't know. I don't know, your viewers can listen to you speak and find out who you are. So yeah, it's that, it's a, it's a weird tension. It's a There's really a good question. question. Cool. Like, this is why I was so nervous about the live stream because I figure that in perform- performance in itself is inherently indulgent because you want people to look at you, but you're also yeah. getting reaction from people and making them dance. So it doesn't feel indulgent. It feels like you're doing it for them. My anxiety right. about going on the live stream is that you can't see that reaction. So it becomes purely about my, on my, from my side, it becomes purely about my own ego. But I think that yes, if you're, if you're that. sorry, if you don't have an ego, you would never make oh, someone. Oh no, you froze. Okay. Dance, right? Interesting. Interesting. If you don't have an ego, you would never make someone dance. That's. Yeah. It's so interesting because, a- like, I don't use these words like ego or or narcissism because they those words actually scare me. Because right. I don't ever want to feel like a narcissist. Yeah, but, but you're not, so you're fine. <laughs> right, but then it's like, but being an artist, like I don't think being an artist and like focusing your attention on yourself, like you're doing a craft, you're practicing each time you go on stage, you're practicing each time you write a song. And it's the same thing in, in another job where you're going to work every single day and maybe it's not seen as practice, but you're definitely working to maybe get that promotion. And while yeah. you're working for a company, like you're still working for yourself to live. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I put it in that perspective as well. Right. But it's, like, yeah, you've it's, asked a very great question. Yeah, it's good, <laughs> they, they say there's no self, they say there's no selfless act of selflessness, right? Like if you give money to charity, although you're doing it for charity, you're still getting a, a rush yourself, but that doesn't mean that you didn't do a good right. thing. So. Right, exactly. I don't know where yeah. that metaphor ties into it, but I'm pretty sure it does. I, I, <laughs> I would say, I would say anyone that's trying to be an artist, like it is definitely hard or anybody that, cause I, I've definitely felt that as an artist, like applying for things or even when people are like, Oh, I love your music. Or I get so like, Oh, <laughs> or like sing. And I get very, uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but I don't want to make it about me. And some like, in those moments, I'm like, should you? Should you be okay with that? Should you stand up for yourself? Because I yeah. come from a culture that's like, don't talk about, don't talk about it. You're, you're, you don't do music. So how do you feel about that? Like, what's your reaction when people are like, I love that song? Because you're also extremely humble. Like, how do you handle those situations? Uh, I, I think I haven't worked, worked out how to handle those. I don't know if you're meant to work it out, but because yeah. then you're like, because I find what happens is I'll go, oh, no, I couldn't possibly sing. And they go, okay, we'll just ask Nina then. And I go, oh, fuck, Nina's going to get to sing, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, you told me the other day, you're like, yeah, I don't really do singing great. And I was like, what? Well, yeah, the singing yeah, team would have been but yeah, I don't know. Lev, Lev, what can- Lev really fucks us with this one. Yeah, Lev. We, we were so good until this point, but you really had me thinking. You really had me, me thinking. Me, so you're going to have Lev on next to promote his upcoming single, When I Hurt You? Lev, I think I would love to have you next. If you would love to do it. Is that going to be your first live stream, Lev? That's my no, question. Lev did, actually, I watched one that Lev did and it was fucking unbelievable. And then okay, his phone Lev, overheated you and halfway me, through. Bruce. His phone overheated? That happened yeah. to me. That might happen to mine. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, no, it's, well, a bit, actually, it's a bit I also got a notification that I'm on 15 or 20%, which is probably on 10 Well, less. I do have two more questions for okay, you. Okay. Actually, wait, no, three more questions. But... One is a little extensive and one is, well, the other two are short. So um, we're at the end of our hot dog, by the way. We've just got to put the couple of sauces on. Uh, so I'm going to wow, put ketchup on. Wow, the metaphor going. That's sick. Oh, of course. This is a story. <laughs> this is how it works. Um, tell me about doing nothing's enough. And I, I know the backstory of it, but please tell us all about what it's, you know, what it's about and the inspiration behind it and how you feel about this song. Um, Doing Nothing's Enough is the song that I have coming out tonight at midnight, everywhere on all of your favorite streaming platforms. I wrote it um, four weeks ago um, on a day in isolation where I got nothing done. And um, like you, Nina, I I try and push myself to do stuff every day and it really makes me panic when I don't. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so I wrote it literally just for myself to make myself feel better. It, it, was, it was completely intended as therapy. Um, mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to do anything with it, but I sent it to our friend Lev, who was watching. And he um, helped me with the production of it. And it said, he said that it made him happy too. And so I figured that, well, this is the narcissism thing. I figured if I was just doing it for myself, then maybe that was not the right attitude. So I thought I'd finish it off to try and hope that it might make one other person feel better about doing nothing. Because at the moment, I mean, the whole concept of the song is that doing nothing is enough. It's the best thing you can do is not go outside. Um, yeah. So we put it together with a team of nine people, I believe. You are one of them. Um, instrumentalists, producers, artwork designers, all completely remotely without anyone leaving their home. I sent it to Jacob Harlick. He played drums, Chris did bass. You laid down some vocals. Ian Kimmel was the producer. Lev also co-produced it, and uh, it's Love like it. it's like a quarantine song that was made out of quarantine. It's like it's like the I think I like to think of it as the Deadpool of songs. Like you know how Deadpool's a superhero that knows he's a superhero, or he knows that he's in a movie. I feel yeah. like my song knows that it's in quarantine, and it's just happy to. It's just happy. It's to just happy to stay there. It was like, yeah, you don't want us to see this or no one, no one was together when we made this, but it's, it's a nice thing and you should, you should, it laughs at itself. I love I that. I, oh, I love that. I am, I am so excited for everybody to hear this song because it, it really does, like, when I heard it the first time, and I'm proud of you, Lev, as well, and proud of Ian. You guys are incredible. Um, yeah, Ian's heard the song in Demo Ian's mode. like 25 drafts or something all within the span of five days. Ian, you're insane. Anyone like that. Ian, you're literally insane. Like, you're so talented. I is don't know you've never met you, but he is. He is. But um, I've never met you, Ian, but lots of love to you. Um, but I just love this song because it's so wholesome. And as you said, like, it knows it's in quarantine and it, it's okay. And it is there to make people happy. And that's exactly how I felt when I listened to it. So I'm so, so excited for everyone to listen to it. Um, and then I have two more questions because tonight you're obviously going to celebrate. Now, with yeah. what bourbon or whiskey or drink or what are you celebrating with tonight? I'm glad you asked, Nina. I have a bottle of Maker's Mark 46. And, uh, Excellent. Might have some champagne, maybe some tequila, maybe polish it off with a glass of water and Gatorade Zero. But, but oh, definitely, yeah. definitely a whole eclectic concoction of, of stuff. That's <laughs> perfect. And why Maker's Mark? Why did you choose Maker's Mark? Because I know that's very important to you. Right. Well, I was telling you this story the other day because Maker's Mark is made by, I believe, three women, two of which are left-handed and one is right-handed. And when they dip the bottle in the in the, the wax to, like, seal it, it, like, comes yep. out with a different sided thing, depending on which handed woman did it. So I, God, that's it so literally cool. adds nothing to the drink, but it's the story thing. It gets me really excited about it because no, it's, it's awesome. like a primal thing. So that's why Maker's that's Mark. Awesome. But this is the 46, which is even better. And more I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> well, that's okay because it's release day. Yeah. Um, and okay, we have one more. Qu well, I have one more question, but I think this is way better. You've got a ton of people asking you to rank the 1975 album. So, Jake, leave us with your. This is the topping. You get to choose the sauce on your hot dog, by the way. This is the final sauce. Please rank the 1975 album for us. Wait, right, rank the new album or rank all of the albums in order that they've made? The new album. Oh, wait. Oh, no, no. Rank the 1975 albums. Sorry. Oh, this is... Well, for me... Well, we can go backwards. I think that the worst album is the first album, but it's the first album. It's just that it's not... For me, it's not as conceptual and it's not as concise. But okay. there'd be nothing without it. But I also think that a debut album, you have to give a little bit of leeway because that, that was like... 10 years in the making, right? Like they had no pressure. So that's gotta right. be good. Otherwise, if you're not gonna make a good debut, you're making nothing good. So I'm making that my worst, the worst album. Also, because it was never allowed to be my favorite because it was my sister's favorite. Ah, big point, but big point. But it, it has the best singles. The best okay. album for me is well, a brief inquiry into online relationships because it's literally like a, he sets out to dissect relationships and he does every single one, whether it's a relationship with jealousy or yourself or with substance or with the internet it's fucking insane it's maybe the greatest album of the last well octave monkeys album was in 2013 so it's the best album of the last well they had another one in 2017 so it's at least in the top <laughs> five albums of the last 10 years okay 
And then Love I Love agrees put, with you. He said, God damn right it is. A perfect and then album. I would, <laughs> I would put, I like it when you sleep, you're so beautiful. And so I'm aware of it just behind that. And I would, there she goes. And I wouldn't include the new album because I haven't lived with it long enough to put it in my rankings. Oh, you're not going to include the new one? No, but I listen. But you, you, that's the album you know best, right, Nines? Because that, that is, listen. that is. Well, I, I know like their first songs and like the first album because that's, I did discover them when like they were kind of starting to pop off, but I right. didn't really keep up with them. So when you and Chris gave me all the knowledge about the 1975, I was like, holy schnookums, it's like come full circle. Um, so yeah. Well, I don't no, know, I you know what? You make a great point. You shouldn't actually but, yeah. rank 1975 albums because they all play into each other. They have like melodies and lyrics that all like line up across them. So in a way, the first one right. is the best because like there would be no other three without that. But in a way, the best, the new one is the best because how the fuck did they incorporate the first, the first, it's just, in, what a band. Fuck. Well, I mean, I, I can't, like, I am not a 1975, like, head master. Let's, master. let's say that. I'm not a master because I don't know the depth that you know. But from listening to the new album... And I, it was the first thing I said when I listened to it. And I said it took me on a journey because I really didn't know what I was in for. The way it started did not have me thinking that was the way it was going to end. Right, and in the middle... Board for all 22 songs, you stuck with it. All 22 bo boards, all 22 songs, I was there and I embraced them all, even the instrumentals, because they put me in a completely different world. I felt like at some point I was in Texas, then in some point I was in Vienna, then in some mm. point I was like, yeah, I'm in LA. We were bouncing and around. I think that's, sure. I was globally bouncing. And I think that's the beauty of, for me, that is the beauty of this album. But you as a master, a 1975 master, the I new album, it. what would you give it? I know you haven't sat with it too long, but for now, what would you give it out of a 10? I, I straight up, and I really mean this, I give them all 10 out of 10. I genuinely believe wow. they made four 10 out of 10 albums only because they were all really in intentional and I think they succeed in what they were trying to do. I, I, I love really that. think they're all 10 out of 10s. Um, I, I, I don't, I, it's just, this is going to destroy me, Nina. I can't believe <laughs> they're doing this. You know what? I, I hope that I can save this video so that we can come back when you have decided. When you have decided... Wait, we'll do a round about, two. We'll do a part two. We'll do a part two. And maybe then we can include Lev if we can include three people into a live and it'll Great just idea. be even better. Great idea. Yeah. And then we'll right. also make you listen to all the singles and you can rank the singles and then we'll have a definitive... We'll make a spreadsheet. <gasps> Let's make a spreadsheet! Oh, yes! We can both be spreadsheet sluts. I love it. <laughs> <I'm so cool. laughs> All right, Jake. Well, thank you so much for jumping on with me today. How was your first live stream? Are you feeling nervous? Do you still have your face and nose and feet and everything? You're not too scared? Well, they say you'll never forget your first time. And Nina, I will never forget my first time. I love it. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you I so much you for lots. jumping on. Thank and I'm going to go listen to your new song. Yeah. I love you. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you to everyone that participated today in chatting and your questions. Lev, I love your question today. It really took me off guard because it is a huge thing um, to consider. Jake, if you're still watching, thank you so much for jumping on today. Um, I'm just so excited when I get to talk to my friends uh, and new artists that you maybe don't know um, and artists that I'm very close with or artists that I don't know. I just, I love it. I love it. And I think this quarantine definitely makes us, you know, the music community needs to band together. We need to remember to support each other. Songwriters, artists, producers, it's a tough industry. So let's make sure we stick together, support each other. Like don't compete. You know, everyone's creating wonderful things and we're like, you're also talented. So please, please, please make sure you support your friends. It's very important right now and all the time. Um, okay. Oh, I'm getting sappy. All right. I'm so excited. Please go check out Jake's, um, new song and I am going to go, uh, chillax and watch the sunset while I listen. All right, guys, stay safe, stay healthy. Love you all. Um, until next week. Mwah!